When the harvest has been gathered And all my work is done When the last mile's been traveled And I've sung my final song If I'm called to give an answer At heaven's judgment seat just let the blood of Calvary speak for me. May he ride me down as righteous where no righteous mess has been. Shield me from wrath and judgment that comes there's all my sin There's no word that I've accomplished Nor my goodness could I plead Just let the blood of Calvary speak for me Some friends who witnessed that would speak a word so kind, but their voice people at such an awesome time. There's a voice that calls for mercy ringing through eternity. Just let the blood of Calvary speak for me. May he ride me down as righteous where no righteousness has been. Shield me from wrath and judgment that covers all my sins. There's no word that I've accomplished, nor my goodness could I plead. Just let the blood of Calvary speak for Could I please just let the blood of Calvary speak for me? Jesus, let the blood of Calvary speak for me. Now, here's Brother Mark. Thank you, Brother Donnie. And thank Jesus for that blood. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. You can believe it. Um, we're still in the book of... First Corinthians today, we're going to be in chapter 7, uh, if you want to find your place there with me this morning, as my mother finds her seat, you know, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, my mom and my wife are, and so many others around me are faithful to be here at Sunday in and Sunday out, and it's just an awesome thing to, you guys don't even know, you get to preach to your mom, I, I'm truly blessed. Uh, to be allowed to do that but uh, in, anyway we're in chapter 7 and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 today and um, Paul's going to be talking about marriage and 
mistake. Uh, I promise you I'm not going to get too vulgar today by any means, by any shape of the imagination. But we are going to talk about some very important things uh, in marriage. And, uh, but as always, as I've said to you before, and this is very important, anytime you're studying a section of Scripture, you need to know about the time and the customs of that time as they apply to the Scripture you're reading. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm going to talk about some certain facts that I'm sure you don't know. And um, I'm going to try to clear up some criticism that old Paul has got about him not being a supporter of marriage. Uh, that is ludicrous to say that. It is uh, not the truth. And we're going to disprove that today. I want to put that to bed um, if you'll allow me that latitude today. But again, it's chapter 7. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. And if you found your place there with me in Scripture, sacred Scripture this morning, uh, I'd invite you to stand with me today in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with the consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontensity. Uh, but I speak uh, this by permission, and not by commandment. Uh, for I would that all men were even as myself, uh, but every man hath hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Y'all pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today with this awesome blessing that you've bestowed upon us to hear your word proclaimed this morning. Lord, we just pray that we would have ears to hear. Lord, we pray that we would take this scripture in the proper context. And Lord, we pray also that we would grow from it uh, and not just uh, give it hearing service as often we often do, but Lord, that we would actually take it to heart and carry it with us that we may behave holy just as you are holy. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Mary, wow. Y'all know that's not my favorite subject to teach on, I promise you. But it is in the Word of God. And the believer is called to apply the whole Word of God to his life. You're not just to take one scripture or one text and apply it to your life. You're to take the whole counsel of God. Well, if you're never reading the counsel of God, Brother Donnie, you're probably not going to apply it to your life. Uh, so if you're reading the full counsel of God, then we're going to apply it to our life. But as I said in the beginning, I want us to get a picture of the timeline that we're talking about. So we're talking about all 30, oh, probably AD, around AD 70 or so, somewhere around there. Don't hold me right to the day. But in that day and in this place that we're talking about, which is what, Corinth, right? The letters to the Corinthian, the first church of Corinth, uh, that's who the letter has been written to. So we're talking to those new believers, carnal believers. Paul has dealt with many things up to this point, right? Division in the church. Uh, there was a man fornicating with his father's wife. Uh, so there was much, much stuff still is at this point going on in the church. And I want you to say, well, you know, Brother Mark, what in the world are you talking about? Well, let's talk about this. Corinth 
Okay, let's, let's talk about it in depth for just a second. And to get an idea of the culture in that day, ladies, it was very rough. Um, men had multiple wives. What do you say, Brother Mark? What's the big deal with that? Well, ladies, the big deal with that is uh, one was des designated, and they were bought. They were tangible property. Uh, the father of the bride sold the bride to the husband. She became tangible property. Listen to me. It is not like it is today. It's a different culture. Uh, we're talking about a, a culture where uh, agreements were made. Contracts were drawn up between the husband and the father for the bride. So they had multiple women. Okay, now what was the use? Now we're talking about Corinth here. The use of these women were what? Uh, they, one, they put one in charge of maybe the fields, one in charge of the kitchen, <laughs> maybe one in charge of the family room. Uh, I'm not totally sure. Okay, then the husband went up to the temple, okay, where they had food, alcohol, and what else? 1,000 vestal virgins. They weren't virgins by any means. These were prostitutes. Okay, so the husband was not home with his wives in this day, in this time when this letter was written. He was where? He was out committing sin. He was what? He was fornicating. Okay, fornication is what? Paul said flee from it. Fornication is sex outside of a marriage. If you're not in a marriage and you're sleeping with somebody, you're fornicating. The Bible says flee it. If you're a believer, if you're a believer in the sound of my voice on this internet and you're living with someone outside of marriage, you're in, you're in sin, okay? You're, uh, in, you're, you're out of fellowship with God. You're committing a sinful act. These guys at this day and time would have the ladies at home that uh, they were using as slaves, virtual slaves. They were, okay? They were using them as virtual slaves. Uh, they bear children and they took care of the children and they took care of the entire home and the guys went up to see the prostitutes on the weekend or in the evening or whenever they wanted to eat uh, you know so for us to say that we could apply our culture to that culture is crazy we couldn't do that okay so are you getting a picture of a woman's life in that time uh, it was terrible uh, it was nothing but slavery uh, you can say whatever. He, she was at the whim of her husband. Okay. Uh, and even in today in Palestine, the Bedouins, uh, they have multiple wives. Uh, I don't know that they have temples anymore <laughs> like this. Aphrodite Temple, it was Aphrodite Temple. It was a pretty bad place. thousand virgins on staff all the time, Miss Jewel. 1,000 virgins. Vestal uh, virgins. They weren't virgins. They were prostitutes. 1,000 prostitutes uh, on hand at all times. Uh, when you went there, you, uh, you eat food, you drank alcohol, and uh, the name of their religion was sex. Um, it was just as you imagine with 1,000 prostitutes. Uh, it was very, very messed up uh, by our standards today. Uh, and our standards today are probably not nearly as they, good as they were 30 years ago. But uh, the, the woman's life was very enslaved. And that's the point I want to make to you today. Um, and Paul, Paul does start to address that uh, right here in the first, in the first scripture. Uh, it is good for a man uh, not to touch a woman. Well, you know... Uh, over and over we say that Paul is not against marriage. Nah, that's not true. Uh, what was Paul? Paul was a missionary, right? Okay. In his lifestyle, and that's, uh, that's who most commentators think he's talking to, uh, is, is in his lifestyle, uh, being a missionary, if he drug a wife with him, what would happen? It'd be rough, wouldn't it? It'd be hard on her. And even if he didn't take her with him, sometimes he was gone 10 years. I mean, what kind of life is that? So he's talking to the people there 
that are uh, um, considering that field. Um, nevertheless, to avoid, avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So what has he done here in verse 2? Ladies. He said you don't need three, four, five, ten wives, right? He said let us let every man have his own have her own husband. Uh, so what's he done? He's moved in a different direction. Uh, you know, he's finally putting the wife back where in Genesis, uh, where God said uh, to leave your mother and father, cling unto your unto your wife. Uh, God instituted marriage, and he instituted it between one man and one woman. Okay, homosexuality is abomination in the sight of God. Uh, Leviticus, read it. I, you know, take it up with them. Uh, take it up with God when you get there. But marriage is between one man and one woman. Here, Paul is clearly clearly reinstating uh, what man perverted all those years. I mean, God didn't intend you'd have three or four wives, folks. I know the TV shows that are on about polygamy out in Nevada. I'm telling you right now, they're in sin, uh, according to Scripture right here. Uh, you're not to have three or four wives. One man, one woman. Uh, you know, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about divorce rates in uh, professing Christians. It's 51%. Wow. And God hates divorce. And it's still 51%. Well, now I want to shock you a little bit. You might not know this. You may know this. Uh, guess what? If a couple goes to church together Sunday, study the Word of God together, and pray together, that number falls to 33%. Wow. What does that mean? You know what it means. God it means God intends you to come to church. He intends you to come to church with your spouse, and He intends for you to study the Word of God. It's, this is not hard. Uh, you know, twenty percent. I'll take that. That's pretty good. Or nineteen percent. Excuse me. Let me get my facts wrong here. But let's look down a little farther. So Paul clears, clearly establishes here in this time of slavery. One man and one woman. Okay, let e everyone have his. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Right? He clearly establishes one and one. Right? Let's look a little farther. Let the husband render unto the wife due ben benevolence. You're not supposed to be cold to your spouse, folks. Have you ever met a couple that people are just cold and rude? Well, yeah, you, you know, I think I think about that person. How in the world can they be around them? How? How in the world can you be around someone that you say, I love you to, and they gaff you off? How do you do that? Here, clearly, it's commanded to both people, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Likewise, also the wife unto the husband. You're not to be cold to your spouse, folks. You, you know, why you're to be made one flesh, right? Right? Are you all with me? I know, I know a lot of you this may not apply. I mean, you might be thinking, well, you know, Brother Mark, I really don't want to hear all this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm 65 years old, and I'm not going to get married again. Well, fine. Are you going to give advice to your grandson or granddaughter? Are you give, going to give them biblical advice, or are you going to plan on getting it from the world? That's where most people get it, the Internet. Oh, you know, the people that are on there that say the Bible is a lie. You know the people I'm talking about. Yeah, those folks. Oh, I guarantee you they've got, a, they've got a serious awakening coming. But anyway, uh, you're, you're to be giving advice, biblical advice, Christian, to your granddaughters, your, your great-granddaughters. You're to be giving them biblical advice. The Word of God is what you're to be giving them, not what you think or what you feel. You're to be giving them the Word of God. You want to you wanna know why we've lost a couple generations? Uh, Christians, because you're not talking. You're not giving people the Word of God. You're not. It's proof positive. Look at the divorce rates. And we're just a little bit behind. At uh, 51%, we're just a little bit behind the world. Uh, so... 
And again, and down here in 4, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. What has happened here? Paul's taking, taking ladies out of the slavery side of things, under the soul of the husband, right? Uh, you know, of course, uh, there, can only, there can't be two people deciding things. It comes down to a, a decision. We know that. We know that, you know, the guy should make that. He's going to be held accountable unto God for the state of his household. Men, I'm talking to you. He held accountable. Now, you may not like that, but you're a guy for a reason. Take responsibility for your own home and the state of your marriage. <clears throat> but we're not uh, to use sex as a weapon in a relationship. That's not what the Bible says. You're not to be doing that. You're also not to be fornicating. These guys were leaving uh, the sanctity of the marriage. Okay, they were going on the hill. They were eating and drinking and being merry and having sexual relationships. They were fornicating with prostitutes. That is the time that we're talking about here. What is Paul doing? He's trying to set the record straight. He's trying to let you know what a marriage should and should not be. You're not to deny your husband. A husband, you're not to deny your wife. Um, defraud ye not one another, except to be uh, with the consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. And come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Look, that's not hard to understand, folks. Sex is not a weapon. Uh, relationships that, uh, that are treated like that often fail. Uh, you see that all the time. It's, it's just a terrible thing. Uh, the only thing that you're supposed to deny your partner about and you're supposed to agree before you do it is prayer and fasting about an issue in the relationship, about someone that you love that's sick that you're praying and fasting for. You know, there's times for that, but what has to happen? You have to come back together unless what? Unless who tempts you? <laughs> Satan. Look, he's got a bunch of demons running around waiting to tempt you. He's going to put that comely girl uh, or guy that you've been lusting around after in secret in your face during this time. Uh, believe me, that thing is going to happen. Uh, you're going to be tempted. It's here in Scripture, it's not a novel thing uh, for you to be tempted. Uh, you're going to be tempted. How you react uh, says a lot about your faith and a lot about who you are as a Christian, and, and your relationship with your husband or wife. Uh, you're not to fornicate. He said, Paul said a few verses ago, uh, a flee fornication. Verse 18 of chapter 6, flee fornication, run from it. So if we're involved, and I know I'm talking long here, if we're involved in any kind of relationship, any kind, uh, the definition is clear, any kind of a relationship outside of marriage is fornication, and you should not be doing it. Uh, you're to flee it. And I know you're, you're getting a belly full of me talking about marriage today, and I know some of you are not married, and I understand that, but again, when called to give godly advice, where are you, how are you going to respond? What if your granddaughter or grandson says, Grandma, I'm thinking about dating this other girl. What's your response? Your grandson's married. Your granddaughter's married. What's your response? Christian, what is the response? So just because it doesn't apply to you doesn't mean it doesn't apply to your life and the life of your, of your family. Uh, please, please get this right. Uh, sex outside of marriage, fornication, is a sin. Sex between anyone that is not married, and I'm talking about a male and a female, uh, is fornication. Uh, if you're in a homosexual relationship, uh, either with two men or two women, you're an abomination in the sight of God. Um, it's scripture, Leviticus, read it. Uh, should be clear, God does not change, he's immutable. Uh, we cannot dwell in those relationships. What am I saying to you? Get out of it. Uh, stop it. Uh, repent of it. Stop it. And uh, write your relationship with God. If you're living with a woman, 
and you're not married to her, guess what? You're, you're guilty of the sin of fornication. Uh, you're to repent of it, you're to stop it, and you're to right that relationship. Uh, I, know, uh, I know in America here today, I know it's often uh, the end thing to do uh, is to live with someone for a while before you marry them. Well, it might be the end thing to do here in America, but with God, it's a sin. God doesn't change. Uh, Christian, if you're doing that, what are you doing? You're out of fellowship with God. He's upset with you. You're in an open sin. You're to repent of it. You're to stop it. You're to right that relationship. I submit to you that if she's good enough for you to live with, she's good enough for you to marry. If she's not, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be there either way. Uh, you're to be married. Uh, anything other, anything, any sex outside of marriage is what? Fornication. Paul says, flee from it. Uh, and I know, uh, I know temptations around us. And I know Satan is attacking the Christian every day. What, what is his goal? His goal is to, to destroy your marriage, destroy your fellowship with God, and not necessarily in that order. He wants to destroy your fellowship with God first. He didn't care about the marriage. He didn't care what you do to your Christian spouse. Uh, he didn't care. Uh, he doesn't care how much damage he does. So uh, when Satan uh, gets in contact with the natural man that still lives in us sometimes, uh, we fight that old, that old man every day. Uh, we fight him all the time. When he, when he gets in there, what happens? We start to get weak. Uh, if we're in prayer, if we're... If we've got a solid relationship with our spouse, how many of these things would be avoided? Well, the numbers are in, 51%. Can y'all live with that? I don't think it pleases God. For I would that all men were, even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after uh, that. Uh, you know, Paul says that, again here, he says, all men that were even as I myself. You know, it's been said that Paul was never married. Uh, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Guess what you have to be to be a member of the Sanhedrin? When he was Saul, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, you have to be married. Now, we don't know what happened to Paul's wife, but at some point, either she must have gotten killed or died. Uh, I'm speculating totally there, be clear. Uh, but to be, a, to, to be a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, you had to be married. So uh, Saul would have definitely had to be married. And you can see right here, his view toward women are not, is not crude or wrong. If he done anything, he picked the woman up from the bonds of slavery and set her back on uh, level ground with, with her husband. Uh, and she was always designed, God designed it to be his helpmeet. Uh, she was never designed uh, to be a doormat that you trod on. You know, we, um, we need to understand that uh, our wives or our husbands are not personal property. They're not tangible property. Uh, believer. Uh, she's a sister or a brother in Christ. Uh, you know, what did, what did God say? Uh, he said, uh, that what you do unto the least of these, do unto me. You know, we better get a grip when we're starting to harm another Christian. Uh, I promise you, you'll suffer loss uh, at the judgment seat of Christ for that. He's not going to, to allow you to harm a hair on their head. Uh, we need to realize who we're with uh, before you speak harshly to one of these people, uh, one of these Christians, one of these believers that are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You need to re-examine what you're getting ready to say to them and, and also realize that you're made one flesh. Does your right arm attack your left arm? Does your right arm, I mean, does your right eye have your hand pluck your left eye out? No. You guys are one uh, we have got to get to that today if you uh, want to see uh, your relationship prosper. Uh, we, we need to understand that we can't go uh, 
we can't behave as the world behaves. You guys are set apart. You're called. Uh, you're a pilgrim. This is not your home. Uh, we're just passing through. But while we're here, we're to behave holy as God is holy. Uh, I say therefore to the unmarried, to the widows, it's good for them if they abide even as I. In other words, Paul was not married uh, at that time. I, I, apparently he was a widower. Uh, but, uh, but if they cannot, uh, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. It is better to marry than to fornicate. It is better to marry than uh, for you to burn in lust when it consumes your life. So, uh, you know, we see here that uh, Paul did a few things. Again, he set women uh, back in the proper perspective. And I know different countries do things differently. Um, I know that uh, some countries are still like the Bedouins over there in Palestine. They are still having many, many wives, and they're still personal, tangible property. Uh, but I tell you now, uh, the Christian person that you're married to is not your property. It's your brother and sister in Christ. It's not your property. It's not yours to uh, do with as you will. And that being said, we're not to deny our wives and we're not to deny our husbands. Uh, we're to uh, submit unto them. You know, we're to uh, your one flesh. Uh, you know, you need to give that uh, reverent respect. I mean, Scripture wouldn't say it if it wasn't meant to be applied to your life. Uh, you want the number of divorces to go down? Uh, and why? Tell me one more thing. Uh, maybe you can answer this. Send me an email. Why would you marry someone you hate? Why would you do that? But you end up hating them. Why would you do that? Did you maybe not get to know them a, a, a good enough before you got married? Maybe you didn't spend enough time? Did you marry them to destroy them? I mean, tell me your mindset. I'd love to know it. Send us a text. Send us an email. But um, as far as the widowers and the unmarried, uh, you know, Paul says here, he'd rather you got married than to burn in lust, rather than to fornicate. Uh, fornication is a serious thing. Uh, it's done inside of the body. Uh, in that day with this thousand, a group of thousand prostitutes, I know I'm running out of time, with this group of thousand prostitutes, venereal diseases were running wild, just much as they are today. Don't be promiscuous. Don't do it. Uh, the Bible speaks against it. You're not to have sex out of the marriage, outside of the marriage. You're not to do that. We are not to fornicate. Uh, we are not to visit these brothels, these places of ill repute. A Christian should not be found there. Uh, you guys need to live holy as God is holy. It's commanded unto you to do that. And why would you take Christ? <laughs> why would you take the Holy Spirit, one part of the Trinity, into a brothel with you? Your body is the temple of God. You're not to be in a brothel. Uh, these people here were not to be in a brothel. It was serious problems here in the Corinthian church, and Paul sought to, to straighten it out. Well, how did he do it? He put women back up on a level uh, playing field with their husbands, back where they should have always been. Um, and if you want your marriage to work, don't defraud one another. You know, there's enough cold people in the world. You don't need to be cold to your spouse. Uh, you'll destroy your marriage. You'll, you will destroy your marriage. Listen to me. It's going to happen. Uh, don't use sex as a weapon in your marriage. In closing, don't do that. Uh, it will destroy the relationship. And again, if you're a widower, if, if something uh, has happened to your spouse and you know you can't contain and and um, you know again what Paul says is true it is better to marry than to burn in lust or to fornicate uh, you're going to put yourself out of fellowship with God you're going to have a sin problem in your life and it doesn't seem to go away once you start down that road you seem to be able to do it easier and easier so please don't go Paul says what in 16 uh, now, oh, 18, 618, flee fornication, run from it. We're to run from fornication. 
and fornication in this church was running rampant. Uh, you know, if I didn't like what my wife said or done, I just told her to get on about her business and do her job at home. And I, I left and went to this temple with a thousand prostitutes on duty and ate and drank and did what I shouldn't do. Paul said that was wrong, and it is still wrong today. I don't care what culture you live in. Uh, the Bible speaks uh, here in Scripture that it is wrong. You're not to be in brothels. You're not to fornicate. You're living with somebody outside of marriage. Again, it is wrong. You're out of fellowship with God. You're in sin. I don't know if anyone has told you that or not, but you're in sin. Uh, so, in closing, remember who you're talking to when you talk to your spouse. Uh, they're a child of God if they're Christians. If they're not Christians, they're looking at you as an example. Don't talk ugly to them. You've married them because you love them at one point. Uh, so feelings and, and junk in the trunk have gotten the way since then. But you need to remember back to the day that you met them. Apparently they were worthy enough to marry then. So what has happened in that length of time? And what can't be straightened out? Uh, the Bible only gives one reason for divorce. Uh, and really, uh, Jesus said we have hardened hearts, or we could probably forgive that, and that is fornication or adultery. Uh, having an extramarital affair. Uh, we're not to engage in those kinds of behaviors, and I might sound old and trite, but if I do, uh, I'm glad I'm aligning with the Word of God, and I don't care what the world does. God says don't do it. God says don't have an extramarital affair. He just says do not commit adultery. It's one of the Ten Commandments and you're breaking it. You're sinning. Please say, Brother Mark, uh, Jesus can forgive that. Yes, He can. But have you repented and have you asked for forgiveness? And have you realized the relationship that you're getting ready to destroy? And have you realized that who you're attacking, if it's a Christian that you're married to, You've just attacked the child of God. We need to be careful. We need to be careful in these relationships. Uh, don't go to sleep mad. You want some personal marriage advice? Don't go to sleep mad. Don't do it. The problem is going to grow uh, and grow and grow while you sleep. Now, how that happens, I'm not really sure. But do not go to sleep mad. I told my, my niece, Cassandra, when she got married, I said, you want some good advice? Don't go to sleep mad. Don't go to sleep mad, folks. Work it out. I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Work it out. Uh, your marriage is worth it. Uh, your marriage matters much more to God than anything else, anything else on the earth. He instituted it, not me. He instituted it all the way back in Genesis. It was God that put it here. It's not a man-made contract. Did you hear me? It's not a man-made contract. So, uh, again, don't go to sleep mad. Realize the relationship and the uh, contract that you're in. Uh, don't enter in lightly. If there's a question in your mind, don't get married. But don't be out running around having sex either. Sex outside of marriage, fornication, it is a sin. You're in sin, Christian. So don't do it. And you know, you can conquer those desires. Uh, spend that time on your knees praying. Spend that time in the Word of God. Uh, we've got to get serious. We've got to get serious right now. You've lost a couple generations. We have lost a couple generations to the world. There's not a lot of uh, people trying to live biblically anymore. And believe me, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, uh, children are watching your behavior. If you tell them it's okay to go out and have sex outside of the marriage, guess what they're going to do? And I don't want to hear that well, I don't feel okay. Now, who's asking you how you feel? Uh, feelings are deceptive. Get, get it right. They're absolutely and utterly deceptive. If you feel like you love someone and you've already married someone else, feelings are deceptive. The grass is not greener on the other side. Uh, folks, these are serious contracts you're entering into and you're entering into them before God. You're saying, God, I'm going to love this person the rest of my life till death does us part. In sickness and health, for richer, for poorer, 
I'm going to love this person. That's a contract before God. You both swore it before God. Honor your contract. And remember, don't be cold. You don't have to be cold to your spouse. You don't have to be cold. Uh, you know, uh, every time they tell you they love you, you need to answer. Uh, you know, the greatest thing in the world is love. Paul picks up the woman here off of the, off of the floor mat and lifts her up to where she ought to be, even uh, with the man. Y'all stand with me. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. You feel like send us a text or email about the message today. Feel free. Uh, the internet is you know, always there. We would love to hear from you. Um, Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the sanctity of marriage. Lord, we thank you that you did create it between one man and one woman. Lord, we thank you that you uh, did see that it wasn't good for a man to be alone. It's never good to be alone, Lord. And we just thank you for uh, creating marriage. And Lord, we know that it has become very, very bad in this day and time. Lord, we just pray that you would give us strength as Christians. We, we pray that you would put words in our heart uh, when we're giving Christian advice about marriage and about relationships. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, give us clarity of mind and allow us to see your word and your will uh, in our lives when it comes to our relationships and marriages. Lord, we just pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.